After about 30 years of existence, six to eight shows depending on who you ask, and four television movies, the Scooby-Doo franchise was struggling. The formula of five friends investigating mysteries and monsters, ending in a mask off, human was behind it the whole time reveal, was losing steam. Time Warner had purchased Hanna-Barbera to help populate Cartoon Network, and a direct-to-video feature film was proposed. What happened next would change the course of the franchise, as four of the most well-known Scooby-Doo features were released to great success due to the way they broke the formula. The monsters were real! Welcome to what I'm calling, for lack of a better name, Scooptober, where we'll take a look at staples of my childhood, the movies that are, in my opinion, the most nostalgic Scooby-Doo movies out there. Buckle in and get ready for a month of monsters that can't be defeated by taking off their masks. Daph and I should keep an eye on him. Gee, why is it that you always pair off with Daphne, Fred? Uh, well... Alright, this week we're taking a look at Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, a film that's memorable to me for making me love women. I'm gonna cast a spell on you. Mommy! It's also known for having a Billy Ray Cyrus version of the theme song. That was quite the inspired choice. Witch's Ghost was the second direct-to-video movie for the franchise, released in 1999. Despite how legendary Zombie Island is now within the context of the franchise, it had actually been deemed too scary for its youthful audience, and the studio made the team tone down the horror. It's also the movie where Warner Brothers forced the Zombie Island team to work with writers Rick Kopp and David Goodman, who had very prestigious backgrounds such as writing random episodes of TV shows together. Yeah, totally makes sense to give them control over an hour-long Scooby-Doo movie for kids. Now before everyone comes for me about the title, please just hear me out because I never recklessly dump on a piece of media, I always try to come with analysis. I'm going to talk through the basic plot of this movie and then break down where I see the problem. So, as the movie opens, the mystery gang are in disguise, solving a case at a museum after hours, when acclaimed horror writer Ben Ravencroft mysteriously shows up and helps them with the arrest. Velma fangirls over him and he invites the gang to his hometown in Oak Haven, Massachusetts. The fall vibes are immaculate there, that is undeniable. To Ben's surprise, the town has been made into a campy 17th century tourist attraction featuring the supposed ghost of Ben's ancestor, Sarah Ravencroft, who was persecuted as a witch in 1657. Ben insists that Sarah was a misunderstood Wiccan who used her knowledge to heal others with natural remedies. The team meets the Hex Girls, the lead singer of which is 116th Wiccan. Shaggy and Scooby eat a bunch of food, members of the gang experience multiple encounters with the advertised ghost of Sarah Ravencroft, eventually catching her around two-thirds of the way through the story. Thorn of the Hex Girls' father, the mayor, and other townspeople have been orchestrating the fake ghost to increase tourism in the town. They decided to do this after accidentally digging up the marker for the real Sarah Ravencroft's grave, from which her body was actually missing. Now this is about where the story done by the external writers ends. The original concept of the movie was going to end with the unmasking. I don't know how heavily Ben Ravencroft played a role in that iteration. Perhaps he was just an acquaintance of the gang and the reason they went back there. But the Zombie Island team then rewrote the script to include the rest of the story, which I think is the part that most people find memorable about this movie other than the Hex Girls. So the team discovers Sarah Ravencroft's spellbook by digging around her gravesite. Ben reveals that he lied about everything and that she was really a witch, so his ancestry means he's a warlock. He created the entire mystery at the museum that the team was helping out with at the beginning of the movie to meet them and bring them to his hometown to trick them into finding the spell book. He releases Sarah thinking she'll help him rule the world, but she doesn't give a shit about him and starts destroying everything to get revenge for the Wiccans, imprisoning her in the book in the 1600s. I have the book! And I will return you back into the book. Wait a second. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The book. <laughs> After realizing his mistake, Ben tries to return Sarah to the book, but apparently only a Wiccan can do that, so the gang works to get the book and fend off the ghost. Who would win? A 350-year-old ghost or this bucket? They get chased by goofy, scary living pumpkins and a giant turkey. Velma convinces Thorn, the 116th Wiccan, to read an imprisonment spell from Sarah's book, and they trap her. But in a grisly turn of events, she grabs Ben and drags him back with her into the book, which immediately is incinerated, resulting in a bunch of kids watching the villain die right before their eyes. Didn't WB want a less scary movie than Zombie Island? 
I'm low-key glad that they didn't listen, at least here, because the entire sequence with Ben summoning Sarah is very scary and beautifully animated. Anyway, right after watching Ben's unceremonious death, we get another Hex Girls song to end the movie. That's it. That's the end. No one even really shows any emotions at all about his death. Shaggy is smiling and cracking jokes. Like, I know he betrayed them, but they've just spent a bunch of time with this guy and watch him disappear from reality, and this is all they have to say. Ben Ravencroft's last book is one the world will never buy. They're just jamming with the goth girls, and then we're done. Okay. Witches, ghosts, talking dogs. Scooby-Doo comes face to face with a witch's ghost in a totally cool all-new video. Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. You can bring from the mystery only on video today. Yikes! A beast! I think we've stumbled onto a mystery. Here comes old ugly! You're watching Scooby-Doo and the Great Big Saturday Morning. Sorry for literally taking you through the entire movie, but I felt it was necessary to now explain the issues that I see with the writing. Let's get into that. First of all, the story relies heavily on a sensationalized understanding of Wicca that is deeply flawed. Wicca is a modern pagan religion that was introduced to the public in 1954 by retired British civil servant Gerald Gardner. The principles and practices of Wicca were outlined in the 1940s and 50s by him and Doreen Valiente, a high priestess. So there's absolutely no way that Sarah Ravencroft could have been a Wiccan in the 1600s. And if Velma knows about Wiccans, as she says she does, that's a pretty glaring error to not catch in Ben's lies. Nor could Wiccans have trapped Sarah in her spellbook given that they did not exist back then. Thorn is also supposedly 1 16th Wiccan, meaning her great-great-grandmother or grandfather was Wiccan. And given that she seems to be in her early 20s and the movie came out in 1999, pretty much everything the movie says about Wiccan history and lineage is incorrect and impossible. I also do not believe, based on my understanding of the subject, that Wicca is passed down between generations genetically. Anyone can choose to practice it. They're treating it like the witch lineage in Sabrina the Teenage Witch or Wizards of Waverly Place or something. And as a side note, if you're interested in different interpretations of fictional magic and popular culture, I did make an entire deep dive on that last year. I'll leave the link in the description. I honestly think it would have been a much better choice to make up a fake occult practice or leave it without a name rather than to falsely use a real religious practice in the story. When you misrepresent a concept that kids might be learning about for the first time, that leaves a lasting false impression of that concept for them. I'm also disturbed by the moments where Velma and Ben are pushed together in a seemingly romantic way. I don't care if they're not teenagers anymore in these movies, she's way too young for him, and he's in a position of power as a famous writer that she admires. They had no reason to be doing this. And in the beginning of the movie, why did no one question that Ben Ravencroft was in the museum after hours? Was Velma, who's typically incredibly sharp, really that starstruck? It's so weird to see Velma acting this way and getting the wool pulled over her eyes, especially when she's so quick to figure out the townspeople's fake witch scheme. Velma, in general, just feels a little bit out of character here, and not in a way that I find innovative or interesting. Now these are just a couple specific things about the movie that stand out to me and speak to messy writing on the part of Cobb and Goodman, the two writers who were brought in to work with the Zombie Island team. But there is a larger problem with Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, and it ties into what we've already discussed about these four movies. Now, as we've gone over in my videos about Cyber Chase and Alien Invaders, the team was unhappy with the final results and the loss of autonomy in creating for the franchise in both Witch's Ghost and Cyber Chase, after the success that they experienced making Zombie Island and Alien Invaders. These four movies weirdly ping pong back and forth between autonomy and corporate intervention, and we've been going backwards this month from Cyber Chase to put the pieces together in real time. Following up Zombie Island with a regular old mask off villain story was a completely uninspired choice made by people who did not write for animation. Cobb and Goodman had written about 20 episodes of random television shows together before they were handed writing responsibility on Witch's Ghost. And by the way, Goodman wrote the first two Fred movies. Not a great rap. 
the external writer's version of this movie actually stopped two-thirds of the way through the story, and the Zombie Island team rewrote the film to include the last third, maintaining the theme of real monsters from Zombie Island. I personally think that the only thing that keeps the first 40 or so minutes afloat is the Hex Girls, who introduce excitement by making viewers everywhere love goth girls, singing a fantastically animated song, and introducing the question of whether or not they're actually witches. Warner Brothers' decision to give these guys charge of the plot of the film made its outcome inevitably worse, no matter how hard Davis Doy and Glenn Leopold of the Zombie Island team tried to save it. Because even though their addition of the third act makes the movie much scarier, much darker, and much more in fitting with the real supernatural elements of the previous entry that was so acclaimed, they were still essentially tacking that entire sequence onto a drawn out, regular old bland episode of the franchise that does nothing to push characterization or innovate the format. It's mostly just dated surface level jokes. I and fall vibes. The monster is fake and driven by a scheme for money by a bunch of regular old bozos. And the inclusion of Ben setting up the crime in the museum in the beginning just to meet the gang seems like the most glaring retcon of the original screenplay. Now maybe if the movie came out now, it would be pretty awesome, but to be the movie that follows up after Zombie Island, I just feel like the expectations are set so high and they inevitably fall short here because they weren't given creative control. Don't worry. I've seen enough to know where this is going. Cartoon Network presents a Scooby-Doo mystery. They've unmasked the world's scariest villains, but this time Scooby-Doo and the gang may have finally met their match. Conjure up the ghost of a 300-year-old witch and it's going to take more than a box of Scooby snacks to send her back to where she came from. Cartoon Network's Cartoon Theater presents Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, Saturday at 7, right here on Cartoon Network. Now, in the spirit of not just dogging on this movie for 10 minutes and dipping, I would like to talk about some things I appreciate. I love how Shaggy and Scooby's movements are synced up when they're at the restaurant. They're kind of in the background in this movie, but their friendship is adorable as always. I realized while watching this that part of the reason I love this franchise so much as a kid was because Scooby is freaking adorable. He's the best dog ever. I just want to give him a hug. Is that weird? Does anybody else want to hug Scooby-Doo? The backgrounds for this movie are stunning. There are so many beautiful shots in here that are just straight up nice to look at. I especially love the animation in the Hex Girls' first performance sequence. Like this shot of the smoke as they're performing, and the dynamic and creative shots of them playing or singing. And also the summoning sequence. The mood crafted in the summoning sequence is excellent, and I remember that entire last act feeling absolutely terrifying as a child. The Hex Girls are obviously a high point in general. They became recurring characters in the franchise, I know all the words to their songs, I was obsessed with them as a kid, and they have proven to be endlessly marketable to the nostalgic goth zillennials like myself. I love the pro-ecological message of the Hex Girls' second song, even if them being eco-goths is kinda random, there does seem to be like around the year 2000, the idea that goths also love the earth, uh, which I can get down with as somebody who likes to wear goth clothing and also cares about the environment. Um, reminds me of another certain goth girl that I adore and a lot of people dislike these days. Ben Ravencroft is a scary dude and his performance by Tim Curry is fantastic. He's so reserved in the first two thirds and really lets loose in the third act. I mean, he's made to voice mysterious, cunning, evil guys, and he always kills it. I love Ben's character design, and his sudden demise is remarkably dark for a movie that was supposed to be easing up on the horror. If you're mad at me for how I feel about this movie, I totally get that. It's nostalgic as hell for me too, and it's disappointing almost to the point of being painful to watch this movie and involuntarily see all of these issues and feel bored with something that I used to adore. I'm not having fun putting my thoughts out there about this one in particular. I feel like I shattered an illusion for myself. One of my favorite purses is a hex girl's backpack. I'm not gonna stop wearing it out during the fall. I wouldn't mind if a friend put this on for a Halloween 
movie night. And I don't blame you or anyone else for loving this movie, even if it's just for the vibes. That's your right. This movie was primarily made for kids, and when I was a kid, I thought it was a bona fide slabberoony. But I said I would make this series this October, and this script is all I could think when I watched the movie again. I guess at least for me, sometimes it's better to leave certain nostalgic movies and shows in the past, and that's why I typically try to stick to talking about things that I love that I think are underappreciated on this channel. I don't really have an answer for how to make this one better like I did in the Cyber Chase video. The Ben Ravencroft is actually a warlock, part of the story is stronger than the rest, and I feel like this could have been a great half hour or 40 minute feature if they had trimmed the fat. Or maybe if they had leaned into the witchcraft or Sarah's backstory harder before the third act. Really, I just wish they had let the Zombie Island team run with their ideas. Lance Falk said in an interview that they were ready to make a career out of making those Scooby-Doo movies together as a team. And we could have had many more exciting and innovative entries if Warner Brothers had just trusted them to do their thing. Instead, we're left with a string of mostly unremarkable hours of Scooby, and a franchise that recently has failed to reinvent itself. I can only hope that the next iteration tries something fresh and new. If you stuck it out with me for this long, I really appreciate you. I have a feeling that this video is going to have a fair share of negative comments, and um, I'm not super excited about that, but I already said I would make this video, and I'd rather present my honest thoughts to you than just pretend I'm okay with something that even the writers were unhappy with. I'm super excited for next week because we're going to be taking a look at the best of the four, the movie that changed everything, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. After the past few weeks and my mixed feelings about the different entries, I'm thrilled to revisit a certified banger. And I hope you are too. Take care of yourself, get some exercise, stay hydrated, tell your friends you love them because you never know when they're going to go, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching. Earth, wind, fire, and dirt. Fucking magnets, how do they work? <laughs>